This video is supported by CuriosityStream. As many of you know, I uh, drive an electric car these days. I may have mentioned it a time or two, but before I went electric, I actually drove a diesel. A diesel Volkswagen Jetta. Because they're so clean, remember? No controversy there. The thing was about that though, it got like 60 miles a gallon. I mean, the efficiency was just off the charts. Granted, when I revved the engine, it made a whole cloud of soot, but it was very efficient soot. Now, I don't know if the efficiency made up for the dirtiness of the diesel, but that's how I justified it at the time. And besides, there was another type of fuel that everybody was talking about at the time, biodiesel. I was kind of hearing about biodiesel everywhere at the time and how it was, you know, almost carbon neutral because it was making fuel from plants that were pulling CO2 out of the sky. Willie Nelson even had his own brand of biofuel that he called BioWilly and that was up on, you know, billboards all around Texas. And the stuff I was hearing about it sounded like a, a, practically a miracle. I mean, it was made, you could make it from vegetable oil. It was, you know, way cleaner than other types of diesel. It worked on regular engines, didn't require any modification. Some people actually claimed that it would clean your engine for you. And if you're ambitious enough, you could actually make the fuel yourself at home from spent vegetable oil. I heard stories about people who did that. They would just go around to restaurants and collect vegetable oil and just make their own diesel at home. Free fuel, basically. It's, it's kind of a hippie thing, but I dig it. And actually, I, I had every intention of setting up a little diesel refinery in my backyard where I could go around and use vegetable oil and just make my own fuel. I was ready to go all Ed Bigley Jr. on it. Take that global oil industrial complex. And I would show you my home refinery out there right now, only, as you have probably already guessed, it never really happened. But biodiesel in general never really happened, you know? There was so much hype about it at the time, how it was gonna, you know, promote farmers in the United States, give us, you know, energy independence, not to mention the carbon neutral thing. And for a brief, shining moment, <laughs> it, it almost looked feasible. You know, the price of oil was high, the price of diesel was, was higher. Like, it was so high that it actually kind of made economic sense for me to try to build a home refinery in my backyard. But then the price dropped, and biodiesel just kind of became a niche hippie thing. Today we're hearing similar rumblings about algae, microalgae specifically. Could this be different? Or are we about to see history repeat itself? When people hear biofuels, they often think of it as a weird niche hippie alternative to real fuels, but really when it all comes down to it, all fuels are biofuels. Just some took millions of years to process. Pockets of oil usually occur in places that were once shallow lakes or coastlines. Year after year, giant algal blooms would grow, absorbing CO2 and sunshine, and then die and settle on the ocean floor, taking that carbon and energy with it. Over millions of years, this would pile up, get covered up by geological processes, and compress tighter and tighter until it became hydrocarbons like oil, coal, and gas. As I learned in the Shawshank Redemption, geology is the study of pressure and time. Given enough pressure and time, algae can turn into coal, coal can turn into diamonds. So really the idea of biofuels is to turn that algae into fuel without the middleman of millions of years of geology. When talking about biofuels, you often hear it described in terms of generations, like first, second, and third generation. First generation biofuels are basically food crops like wheat, sugarcane, and corn. In fact, ethanol has been made from corn for decades and power a lot of machinery and transportation. Uh, this is what Willie Nelson was getting into. The problem with first gen biofuels is it competes for space with food crops, which can reduce crop yields and lead to higher food prices. And it often creates more emissions to harvest and refine it than the crops absorb. Second generation biofuels are made from non-food crops like wood, organic waste, food waste, and specific biomass crops. This is kind of like the idea that I had of using the vegetable oil. This doesn't compete with food crops and reduces waste by recycling previously used oil, which cuts down on the energy to produce it. Third generation biofuels are based on algae, and this is the big one, at least we keep hearing. Algae grows really fast, they lock away a lot of carbon, can be grown in places that don't compete with existing food crops, and are easily processed into fuel. Now, it needs to be said that this is not carbon negative. Once this fuel is burned, you're basically replacing into the atmosphere something that you took out of it, but it is carbon neutral, so it's a step up. Algae as a fuel source hit the mainstream consciousness in the early 2000s, with literally dozens of companies raising billions of dollars to iterate on their own versions of this technology. A company called Solozyme got out of the gate claiming it could make competitively priced fuel by 2012, and another called Petrosun claimed they could produce 4.4 million gallons a year. 
One of the most aggressive forecasts was written by Jim Lane of Biofuels Digest, who said that Algo Biofuel could reach 1 billion gallons by 2014. To which the company Alginol said, challenge accepted, and claimed that they could make 100 million gallons of fuel by 2009 and a billion by the end of 2012. Spoiler alert, that didn't happen. In fact, the majority of these companies either went out of business or they had to pivot to selling algae byproducts like nutraceuticals and animal feed additives, cosmetics, and specialty oils. So why did so much hype go so spectacularly wrong? It might be a better place to start as to why there was so much hype in the first place. So the thing that makes biofuels biofuels is the lipid content. Lipids are fatty molecules found in cells that store energy and provide structural support, especially in plants. In simple terms, this is where they lock in the sun's energy with the help of carbon dioxide and nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And as photosynthetic plants go, algae is the undisputed king, with 40% of their volume being made up by these lipids. Lipids that can be converted into diesel, synthetic petroleum, butanol, and other industrial chemicals. And some studies have suggested that an acre of algae can produce up to 5,000 to 10,000 gallons of fuel a year, which is way higher than other biofuel alternatives. Now this is reason enough to get excited about it, but on top of that, it grows incredibly fast. Like, you can harvest it daily, and it grows in almost any environment really easily. I mean, just ask anybody with a swimming pool. Actually, it's interesting to think about how much money we spend every year just trying to keep algae from growing. Plus, it can be fed with wastewater, and it doesn't compete with food crops. In fact, it can be made into food crops for livestock. So there's a couple of different ways that you can harvest algae. There's the closed loop system and the open pond system. Starting with the open pond system, first of all, it's the cheapest possible system that you can do to grow algae. The problem is it's open to intrusive species like predators and pests and pathogens. There's a low surface to volume ratio because the cells that are underneath can get stuck in the shade and it reduces their growth. And it's not that scalable. It needs a lot of land, so if you want to really scale it up, it can take up a lot of land. Closed loop systems, on the other hand, use flat panels, tubes, or plastic bags to kind of push the algae through and let it grow in these, in these tubes. Uh, now, this keeps out organisms and reduces evaporation, but it is more expensive, and there's issues with CO2 transfer, and it can build up oxygen inside of it, which can actually kill the algae. And as for how that algae gets turned into fuel, the methods of conversion vary wildly, but uh, here's my strained understanding of it. Algae is grown in the ponds or in the closed loop system using water, nutrients, and CO2. Water is evaporated away as much as possible, and then the algae is harvested through a series of processes, including flocculation that settles the algae, air flotation, and then finally in a centrifuge. Water and nutrients are recycled back into the ponds to grow more algae for the most part. Some is spent to prevent salt buildup. Then a solvent is added that separates out the oil in a process called transestiferication. The spent algae and water is then put through a fermentation process that creates methane, which is then used to power the system. The raw oil is then treated with hydrogen to create biodiesel and jet fuel. So all of this sounds kind of great, right? So why did all these companies fail at this? It's the economy, stupid. Like most burgeoning technologies, we have the technical ability to do this. It's the economics of it that we're having trouble making work out. Currently, even with all the recycling involved in that process that I just described, and even with the open pond system, which is way less expensive and way less maintenance and all that, it is still far more expensive than fossil fuel extraction. Analysis of algae biofuels over the year has ranged everywhere from less than a dollar a gallon, which is wildly optimistic, up to $40 a gallon. But more recent estimates have put it somewhere between $10 and $20 a gallon at the scale of around 10 million gallons a year. For perspective, regular diesel is averaging around $3 a gallon right now, and the United States burns about 170 million gallons of it a day. Now, two of the main cost drivers that need to be perfected for this to be able to work are the growth rate and the lipid content, and uh, researchers are working on ways of improving that through selective breeding and genetic modification. Now, there are some sustainability issues around algae biofuels, namely the space needed to make them. The open pond systems take up a lot of land, and they're going to take up even more land as you scale it up, and that can start to compete with food crops and can lead to deforestation. And the fertilizers involved might start to compete with food crops, especially phosphorus, and as that scales up, then the price of phosphorus and the price of food might go up. And some people argue that the CO2 benefits of algae biofuels is actually pretty weak once you factor in the transportation of the fuels and the fertilizer and the production of all that. But perhaps the biggest nail in the coffin for biofuels right now anyway is that currently it takes more energy to produce it than you get out of it. Now believers in algae biofuel believe that these are just challenges that we'll be able to solve over time. We'll just chip away at it little by little until we figure it all out. And that may be true, and I hope that's true, but it might honestly require like a moonshot project to get there, something on the level of getting to the moon or splitting the atom. 
And I don't know, for me personally, I think if we're gonna spend hundreds of billions of dollars on a moonshot project, that project should be fusion. But that's just me. But that doesn't mean I think biofuels have no place in our energy mix or that they're not important. In fact, looking long term, I think they might actually be pretty critical. Because fossil fuels aren't renewable. You know, it's not an inexhaustible source of energy. You know, you can't just grow more oil. Eventually we will run out or get too expensive to extract to be useful. In a 2013 report, British Petroleum, BP, suggested that at our current rate of consumption, the world is gonna completely run out of oil reserves in 53 years. Now granted, the oil industry is really good at finding new ways of getting oil out of the ground, like oil shale extraction. Uh, so there may be some more out there, but our rate of consumption is accelerating as well. You know, we may find that alternative fuels like biofuels or maybe fuels derived from direct air capture are just sort of the natural progression of how we produce, you know, combustible oil. It's just out of necessity. And I think the energy companies know this, which is why when you do a Google search for algae biofuels, which I did a lot of in researching this video, the very first link that comes up is a sponsored ad from ExxonMobil. Keep burning that gas, kids, we got this. Yeah, they don't got this. Algae biofuels, unfortunately, have a very long way to go, but there's a lot of clever people out there that are chipping away at this, and who knows, we may be hearing more about this in the coming years. Now, there are some people that say that the drop in prices for wind, solar, and energy storage have accelerated to the point that biofuels will never be able to catch up. So, are you one of those people? Do you think that biofuels are a pipe dream, or is there something awesome about them that you know that I don't? It's very possible. Discuss it down in the comments below. By the way, if you found this subject interesting, but you really would rather have heard it in Sigourney Weaver's voice, all I have to say to you is, you and me both, brother. Luckily, you can do that by watching the Energy of the Future episode of the series Dream the Future on CuriosityStream. Energy of the Future looks ahead to the year 2050 and imagines the technologies that'll be powering our homes and move us around the world. And from there, you can browse the rest of the series, which looks at all the different ways our lives will be different in the near future, the art of the future, schools of the future, medicine of the future, and so on. And yeah, it's narrated by Zool. This is just one of hundreds of top quality documentaries from award-winning filmmakers run by the guys who started the Discovery Channel and one of my favorite streaming platforms. Seriously, I have like seven streaming platforms and CuriosityStream is one of the top two that I watch the most easily. I'm a nerd. Even nerdier, when you sign up at the link below, you'll also get access to Nebula, the streaming service by smart YouTube creators like CDP Grey, Kurzgesagt, Real Life Lore, and me, I'm on there too. I just wanted to say my name in the same sentence with those other guys. It's a place where you can watch our videos ad-free and there are Nebula Originals on there that you can't find anywhere else. And again, it's totally free when you sign up for CuriosityStream, which you can get two months for free if you sign up at my link, curiositystream.com slash Scott. And then after those two months, it's only $2.99 a month. It's, it's crazy. It's the, it's the best deal you can find out there. Anyway, CuriosityStream, if you haven't checked it out, it's awesome. Two months free. Nebula. Just do it, nerd. Big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping support the community around here, keeping the lights on. Uh, I've gotten to know lots of them. They're really awesome people. Uh, there's some new people that have joined. I gotta shout them out real quick and murder their names. We got Molly Grace, Gurniel Kang, Warp Institute, Stephen Ubenhocker, uh, Greg Malia, Susan and Rick Joyce, Cameron, John Hookings, Monte Joyner, Stefan Fenar Sigurdsson, Told you you'd have a trouble with that. Uh, Ed Fisher, Dan Babbage, Harsha Chandra Shashir Korea? <laughs> I thought I'd do better at that. Uh, John Willis, Kelly Coates, Rebecca Williams, my friend from like fifth grade, uh, Josh DeRoos, and well, there's some uh, community members who have joined in the membership thing here on YouTube. There's uh, Harry Evett, who has an amazing channel of his own, uh, Orlando Bird, Lord Astonis, Ellie Holmes, Tori Romanoff, Tony Romanoff, and Frode Solger Block. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> if you would like to join them and get access to videos earlier than everybody else and join a really cool community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that one. Any of the others on the side that have my face on it. And if you do enjoy those, I invite you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. Also, t-shirts are available at the store, answersofjoe.com slash store. Uh, there's a lot of really cool, fun, nerdy stuff there that people, you know, point at you and say you're cool if you wear them. I like to think so anyway. Uh, anyway, you can go check those out, answersofjoe.com slash store. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.